Howdy, and welcome to the show. Huber's Code examines a legal issue and hits the highlights so we all achieve the best results for our clients. I'm Miles Cooper, and I'm very excited to have as today's guest, Ed Lazarus of Lazarus Strategic Services. Ed is a go-to litigation coach, also known to many of us in the business as a jury consultant. Ed comes to us out of a political background from the 80s and 90s and leveraged that into working with the American Association for Justice and then into working as a top flight jury consultant. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Ed. And with that, enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Ed. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I want to go a little bit into your background so people understand a bit about you and how you came to be doing what you're doing. In that vein, can you help us understand how you found yourself working in the field of, we'll call it strategic consulting, because it hasn't always been in the area of the law, has it? No, it hasn't. I was doing what I do now, has happened basically by mistake. Um, was not part of my plan. When I was growing up, I wanted to be governor of California. <laughs> and then I went to school and majored in political science. I thought, you know what? It'd be more interesting to be, sort of be behind that and was working on a PhD in political science when I started a political consulting firm with my then roommate. And we did campaigns for Democratic candidates for House, Senate, mayor all across the country, some overseas work as well, did presidential campaign for Al Gore, not the time that he got the nomination, but the time before that. But we had a fairly successful business going. And after about 14 years of that, I realized I wasn't learning anything anymore, that the 25th Senate race I did looked a lot like the sixth Senate race that I did. And so I needed a change. So I sold back my portion of the business to my partner, I was going to take a year off to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And this was after the 1992 election cycle. Clinton had just become president. And a lot of the people who were working higher up in his administration or in the Democratic Party at the time, I had professional relationships with. As a result of which, I was asked to come in and coordinate the communications and research portions of the DNC with the White House political leadership and the House and Senate Democratic leadership. And basically my job was uh, I'd wake up every morning, drive to the White House. Some days I would get to my office on the Hill, some days I wouldn't. And I was working uh, mostly on the healthcare plan. It was a great experience. I mean, it was a terrific experience to have had. And if I had it all to do over again, I would still jump at that opportunity. Having done it for a year, don't ever need to do it again. So after that year, I decided I would leverage that experience and my political experience prior to that into doing strategic consulting work for sort of three main pillars of the Democratic Party, the, the state party organizations, labor unions, particularly the Education Association, National Education Association and its state affiliates, and the trial lawyer community. And after about two years of doing that, I woke up one morning and 80 to 90 percent of my domestic business was somehow related to the legal profession. I had a lot of state trial lawyer associations as clients. I had the National Association as clients. I had the ABA as a client for a while. I had a number of state courts as clients. So I figured this was a good thing to spend a lot more time and energy on. I was eventually invited to come in-house at what was then ATLA. It's now AAJ. The American Association for Justice. Correct. Yes. And it was then the Association for Trial Lawyers of America. Once upon a time, it was the American Trial Lawyers Association, but someone realized you could change it and get more words in. And like all good lawyers, they added more words, right? Absolutely. So I worked in-house there for a number of years, about four years, I think. And as I was leaving, I did a lot of CLE lectures while I was there. Uh, how jurors perceive you when you're standing in front of them. I did a lot of uh, survey work and focus groups related to legal topics for the association. And as I was leaving, it was, I think, the last CLE program I was scheduled to do before I officially left the organization I was in Tacoma, Washington, and a lawyer there, not a lawyer from Washington, but a lawyer who was on the program, uh, David Wonder from Arizona, as I was either about to go out or coming back from being out there, he said, hey, I hear you're leaving Atlanta. I said, yeah, I am. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm probably going to go back to the consulting business I had. And he said, have you ever thought about being a trial consultant? I said, I've thought about it a lot. I've just had no idea how to get into that business. And David said, well, Greg, being Greg Cusimano from Alabama, Greg and I, want to start a trial consulting firm, and we think you should be a partner. Done. So that's how I got into the business. So it was not a plan. It just happened. And it's been a very fortunate series of events. 
you made a reference to surveying polling. What is that and how does that play into both politics and trials? Let me start by saying that the research techniques and the science behind them are the same, whether you're doing a political campaign, a market research campaign, which I've done some of, whether you're preparing for a trial, it's all the same science. It's just a different target audience that you're preparing for. But the political consulting business was a polling firm, which is common vernacular, but what we did was surveys of the jurisdiction where the race was, and we analyzed the, the data to help determine what's going to be the strongest message to get our client elected. And we started supplementing that with focus groups, certainly by 1986. So I remember it was the Dashiell campaign was probably the first campaign where we really used focus groups extensively. But the difference between a survey and a focus group, a survey is a closed-ended, typically you can have open-ended questions, but closed-ended, which is a multiple choice, yes, no, A, B, C, or D, agree or disagree, highly structured research tool where you are going out and interviewing literally hundreds of respondents for one project. And from that, you can take this highly structured data and you can analyze it in a way that gives you a great deal of confidence that you understand what the population as a whole feels about a particular topic. The downside of a survey is it does not give the respondents an opportunity to tell you what they're really thinking. So, for example, if you were to say, what's your favorite color, red, blue, or green, someone's favorite color is orange, you miss that. You're not going to find out, right? People for a long time always ask questions about the abortion issue, which missed a great deal of the texture in that issue. You know, favor, oppose, right to abortion. Well, there's a lot of people who are opposed to abortion, but think it should be available as an option for the woman in cases of rape, incest, danger to the mother's life. There are a lot of people who would say they favor abortion, but are opposed to it for purposes of gender selection or convenience, right? So if you're not understanding the texture of people's feelings about an issue, you're going to write survey questions which miss the point. Focus groups, you're dealing with a small group of people and having a conversation with them hours long, two or three hours at a time, and letting them tell you what they think about a topic. You raise a topic, you put it out on the table, and you let them talk. And you certainly have an outline of where you want to go in the course of the conversation, but you're learning from them the language they use, as well as the sort of depth and texture of what they think about the issue. And that is highly informative, both to making a better survey, but also in understanding how to present a case as a lawyer, understanding how the ad should feel as a political consultant when you're putting together advertising for a Senate candidate, that separate from the strict message what kind of mood should it leave you in? What kind of feeling should you have about the candidate as a result of uh, someone having seen this? So both of those tools are, they're complementary. I think they're both very important in the context of a lawsuit. I always want to start with focus groups to understand what we're missing as we look at and analyze the case, what we didn't think of, that they'll think of. But they're, and they're terrific for liability. They're terrible when it comes to assessing damages. The focus groups cannot give you really a generally credible answer on what a case is worth. And why is that? A couple of reasons. One reason, is, and probably the biggest reason, you're only talking to six or eight people, right? So if you're trying to come up with a number with any confidence, you just don't have a large enough sample size to be confident in that number. And, and what you're looking for in a focus group is the breadth of opinion, the range of possible opinion, and how people link one thought to another. I don't really need to know in a focus group that 62% of them feel this way and 38% of them feel that way. I need to understand what is the range of possible opinion about the issue so I can help put together a narrative that takes advantage of or captures or encompasses that range of thought, right? But if you say to me, what percentage of people in that focus group felt this way or what was the number they came up with about that's not an appropriate focus. Six or eight people, you're just not going to get it. It's not a representative sample. By definition, it can't be a representative sample because it's only a, really a handful of people. And that's not its purpose. I want to explore focus groups a little bit more and how you approach them. One of the things I remember in terms of first hearing about you and meeting you, this was pre-pandemic, was a lawyer in town named Dan Delasso spoke highly of you and invited me to watch a focus group on a case that he was doing. And one of the things that I found interesting, and again, pre-pandemic, 
was that you were doing them all remotely back then. So can you tell us a little bit about how you approach focus groups and your thoughts behind the remote versus in-person? And because I am going to ask a totally compound question, your thoughts behind the style of asking people questions and theme development versus the more, what I might describe as the traditional warrior style of focus group where somebody comes in and pounds on their chest on the plaintiff side and somebody comes in and pounds on their chest on the defense side and the pros and cons of those different approaches. Well, I'm glad you raised the compound question because that was going to be part of my answer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And we still do those, by the way. But let me start with the different approaches to a focus group substantively before I get to the technical difference between remote and in-person. Sure. So the advantage of a focus group, as I said, is letting them tell you. We don't really have a lot of interest. I don't have a lot of interest. It's not part of our approach to have focus groups so we can tell people what they should think. We want them to tell us what they think, and we use that information to build a stronger case. So to do that, we use what are called concept focus groups, where we're not going in and presenting our case. We're giving them a piece of information. This is a medical negligence case. What do you think about that? What comes to mind? And here are their feelings about, you know, are they concerned that too many doctors are being sued? They're all leaving town. They're being driven out of business. It's going to cost them money, et cetera. And then by bit, we add information to the case, a fact at a time to hear how each of those facts makes a difference in how they assess what went on. Jurors and respondents, despite being told to wait until the very end of the case to form their opinion, they're constantly trying to tease out in their minds, what is the story here? What happened here? And they're going to come to some conclusion relatively early on. And once they've reached that conclusion, they're going to filter through information and latch on to everything that affirms their perception of what happened and discount everything that didn't. So to find out which facts matter and how much they matter and how they relate to other facts that would come into evidence helps us build a trial story that gets them telling the story inside their mind that we want them to tell themselves as soon as they possibly can. And that's what the concept focus group is for. And as you get closer to a trial date in a large case, certainly we still do structured focus groups. You can do a concept group with some structure in it. You can do a structured group that's got some loose ends to it. It's a continuum. But if you think about a mock trial or a mini mock trial as the most structured approach to a focus group, you're having a plaintiff's presentation, a defense presentation. You might even play some witness testimony. You might even have closing at the end of that, depending on how long a day you want to build into it. And then you're saying, okay, now you've got the case to decide. And you would watch them deliberate and see what they decide. That's the most structured version. And you can back away from that to do things that are, people call them mini-mog trials or have some structure where you have someone playing the role of plaintiff and defendant doing 15 or 20 minutes on each side and then conversation about that. And then back it all the way up to where you walk and say, hi, how are you? Traffic accident. Talk to me. (laughs) Um, So that's the sort of substance of continuum there. But I find if you had in your budget and in your timeline the ability to do one thing in terms of research, I would do a concept focus group as early as could possibly do it. And that would be the one thing. I think that's the most valuable tool that we have out there. This was something that when I first got turned on to working with you, the idea of doing a focus group, first, I hadn't heard of concept focus groups. And second, we were usually doing the mock trial and we we're usually doing it once we knew all the information. And we might redo a mock trial to tailor things with, with some of the learning that we have, but we weren't doing anything early in the process. Why do you recommend what you just recommended that if you're only going to do one thing, do a concept focus group and do it early on? You sort of touched on it, which is to say, once you knew everything you were going to know, you did a mock trial. The problem is there's a lot of stuff you didn't find out probably that jurors care about. And, you know, jurors are not making their decision based upon the instructions they get as to the law. The last thing they hear in a trial is the instruction as to the law. And to think they're making up their mind based on that is just not realistic. They're making up their mind on what they feel the right outcome should be. And they're making up their mind based on things which might not have any relevance according to the law but they're very, very important according to jurors' evaluations of what's going on. So the worst feeling I have as a consultant is when I'm doing focus groups, and by the way, most clients that I have gotten over the years, they come on referral from someone else, as you came from Dan, 
And they're usually calling me saying, I've got a trial in five weeks. Can you help me? And my answer is always the same, probably, but I could have helped you a lot more five months ago. Because the worst thing for me is when we're in a focus group and respondents come up with something that's very, very important to them about how they would evaluate the case. And I go back to my client when the focus group's done. I say, what do we know about that? And they say, we know nothing about that. And it's too late to find out because discovery is closed. The focus group respondents will help you come up with ideas of things you should be looking for in the discovery process that you might not have otherwise thought of. And they will guide you in terms of what's really important in their understanding as to how to decide the case. The fact that they are not lawyers is what make they are jurors. I mean, that's what they are. And that makes their insight very different from the insight that a typical lawyer would bring to the case. And getting the information early to guide your discovery is re- where the real value comes in. I'll also tell you, I've got some clients who do focus groups before they even decide to take a case. If they're looking at a case that's going to be a very expensive case to put on, we'll focus group the case, make a decision about whether or not we want to pursue it. And that's a good use of a focus group. How did you come to make decisions about remote versus in-person for focus groups? My main incentive was to find ways not to get on an airplane. Um, so I had been, between my work as a political consultant and the work I was doing at Adler, which was really coordinating the political and legislative and leadership development efforts across all 50 state TLAs and doing the trial consulting work, I have lived my life on the road. And I was looking for ways to not have to get on an airplane. And I started reading about and thinking about and toying with the idea of being able to do focus groups remotely. And this goes back to 2014, 2013, I think. I think 2014 is when I first started working with your firm, I believe. That sounds about right. So I was reading more about them and learning about the technology that was out there and how it could be used. And Dan DeLasso at the Brandy Firm, with whom I'd done a fair amount of work, called me. And he said, I got a case that really doesn't merit a focus group because it's not, you know, it's really not that big a case. We don't want to spend that kind of money, but it really is a question that I wanted to run by you. And whatever the issue was, he told me what it was. I said, no, Dan, I could take a guess, but that really is a focus group question. I'll make you a deal. And I explained that I was interested in finding out how well online focus groups could work. So I said, you pay the out-of-pocket costs. I'll give you my time for free and we'll try doing a focus group remotely and see how it works out. Since that time, he's never done an in-person focus group. And having done a lot of them, right, to going to never doing any of them anymore since that time. And and that's where you were introduced to this process when he asked you to observe or you asked him or I don't know what that transaction was like on your end. But what I find is that if I were asked what is the best tool available, I would say an in-person focus group. If I were asked what is the best bang for the buck, online focus group, no question. I still don't think it's as good as doing it in person, but it costs a lot less money. It's much easier to arrange logistically. It's easier for the respondents when you should probably get a slightly better recruit because more people can do it, which wasn't true, by the way, in 2012, 2013. There were still a lot of people who weren't online. Now, it's hard to find people who aren't at a certain level. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's got comfort with the technology, but the recruits are easier. So the costs are a lot less instead of paying me by the day, you're paying me by the hour. So it saves my clients money and it works. So that's why we've been doing so many. And obviously during the pandemic, everything became online at that point. But since the pandemic, I don't think I've done an in-person focus group. I was doing fewer and fewer in-person and more and more online leading into the pandemic. And I can remember the last one I did was in January of 2020 in person. I haven't done an in-person focus group since then. So... It's an efficient use of resources. And I remember part of what drew me to wanting to see what you were doing with Dan was the idea that one could keep the costs low and one could use them in cases, I'm not going to course correct, but I'm going to say every case can benefit from a focus group. Not every case can bear the cost. And so we, when we have those smaller cases, we'll find more creative ways to do focus groups like asking friends or talking to the person in front of you at the checkout line or Craigslist recruits or what have you. But, you know, being able to do a focus group is really the best way to get good answers because you're working with a professional like yourself who can kind of parse through things. So when I heard that there were ways to do a lower cost focus group, 
and even potentially not one focus group, but perhaps a couple staged throughout the case and not have to burn 20 or 30 grand in one big pop for an in-person. That's what really fascinated me with the concept. And another aspect of it that you just referenced is it still takes lead time to do the recruiting, but it just logistically is so much easier to set up and decide, you know what, the marginal expense of doing another group right now because we've hit this roadblock or we found this new information or we have this thing we're stumbling over. It's just a much easier decision to make, right? And when you think about what it costs to do an in-person focus group, professionally conducted, professionally recruited in a facility versus, as you said, the cost of doing, you know, one or two or even three of these, or in your case, we also follow up with survey in most cases, you're getting the focus groups in the survey for less than what, it, but probably half of what it would cost just to do in-person focus groups one time. It's not like it's a bargain basement approach. I mean, you're getting valuable information aided by the fact, of course, that surveys now we're doing online as well, as opposed to doing telephone surveys, which are vastly more expensive. But when you use the online tools for survey purposes, combined with online focus groups, and I should say for people who are listening, the online focus group is not like everyone's coming separately to the table and watching video and reacting to it. Everyone's familiar with Zoom now. It is similar to a Zoom format. We don't use the Zoom tool for a lot of technical reasons, but that's what it is. It is six or eight people in a virtual room together having a conversation about the topic all at once. As an end user going through the experience of doing concept focus groups at the beginning of a case, one of the takeaways and where I'm probably an evangelist for the work that you do, whether with you or anyone else, the idea of doing this early in the case and the learnings that come from it I think of cases where we would not have tailored the discovery in the same way as we did because of things that were brought up by the focus group participants. Why does that matter? And the other piece that I will share with you, in a direct exam of an expert, if you run out of questions, the other thing is always what's the significance of that. Having sat through countless focus groups with you, I feel that your mantra is, whenever there is a question posed, was he wearing a helmet? Your response is, why do you want to know that? And that's a question. Why is that the go-to question for you when you're doing the concept focus groups? Why do I want to know that? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for your evangelism. And it's always gratifying for me to hear that the work I'm doing is helping. I mean, really, I just, I can never get enough of that. It just makes me feel so much better inside to know that there's a practical application that is assisting my clients who are trying to help people who have suffered some wrong from someone else. I mean, that's why I keep doing this. This is part of the difference between survey and focus group. You know, the survey can tell you what people think, but understanding the why behind it is what helps you put together the story, right? So do they want to know, was he wearing a helmet or not, right? I think we're thinking about the same case probably. <laughs> Sometimes there are different conclusions people can draw from the answer to that question. And without knowing what's motivating the question and how that factors into the equation, sometimes the answer is they'll tell you, well, I, you know, I was just curious. It doesn't, but sometimes it, it is a marker for them of the care that your client takes or had taken on the work site, or it's a marker for them of the care that the employer or the tortfeasor has taken with something to understand why are they interested in that piece of information helps me, at least, to understand how we put the pieces of the puzzle together and also the order in which we tell the story, right? So if you can say that so-and-so went to work that morning, got in his truck, drove out to the field, got out, set up, he had his harness on, he had his helmet on, he had these tools with him, and boom, here's what happened when something fell and hit him on the head, right? Just being able to include that as part of the story, answers questions for jurors, and in this case, irrelevant as a matter of law, right? But it answers a question for jurors to help them understand the scene and the setting and attribute positive valence to the actions of our plaintiff. So that's why we want to know why. That's always my question, is to make sure I understand how they're fitting the pieces together. Have we explored and discussed the concept focus group enough for us to have an understanding, take the next step, because from what I'm hearing, surveys don't get done before the concept focus. Yeah, that's certainly what my approach has always been. From going back to when we started using focus groups in political campaigns in 1986, 
that understanding the richness and the texture and the linkages in voters' minds or in prospective jurors' minds is a tremendous tool in putting together a survey that makes more sense for what you're trying to get out of a survey. And so, yes, that's sort of the process for me is concept group, survey. If it's not always appropriate, but when it is appropriate, I want the concept group before the survey. And then coming back around again in a major case, we might do more concept groups after that, or we might do something that's more structured as we're leading into trial so that our clients have had the opportunity, one, to test out the, the, the trial story that we're developing, make sure it really works, right? Might need some tweaking at the end. Uh, that's when you use a structured group as you're moving toward uh, actually the day that you're going to open for trial. As we move from that concept focus to the survey, can you walk us through with some level of granularity how you prepare that survey, how the attorney plays a part in it, and what does it actually look like? This is an old school phone polling. It's done a different way. In the olden days, when I was doing political work, it was the only thing we did. You call people on the phone, right? You're calling them randomly. And so theoretically, every telephone household has an equal probability of being reached. Surveys only work if the assumption of randomization is true. Now we do it online. We can control the demography of it so that we're, it's really not random survey in the same way telephone survey was, but truth of the matter is telephone surveys are not random anymore either. I mean, how many people do you know who just answer the phone when it rings? Dewey wins. <laughs> right. So... You know, nobody does that anymore. Yeah. Um, I had an aunt who did that. She would miss a call from a number she'd never seen before, and she would call them back. <laughs> yeah. Right? But the rest of us, we use caller ID, right? So people who don't want to be bothered by someone they don't know, it doesn't work. So as caller ID and cell phone usage was increasing, I was developing more and more doubts about the true randomness of telephone surveys. And then people were, uh, as all good statisticians would do, Reweighting to compensate for the absence of a true randomization. And I'm thinking, as long as you're doing that, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum where we're doing online surveys. People sign up to be part of a database where people are reached randomly, randomly. They do something while they're online that hits a trigger in the algorithm that causes someone who's paying money for the information to poke them and see if they'll participate in a survey. And as I was experimenting more and more with online surveys, comes along the Washington Post who decided they would do the same thing that year. I think it was 2008 that the Washington Post did both telephone surveys in the traditional way and online surveys, same questionnaire, same field dates, and they were comparing the responses. And they found out the differences were negligible and they stopped doing telephone surveys for their political polls. I thought, well, there's a good validation of my theory. Yeah. So now I just do online surveys. They're Again, a lot, a lot cheap. And they are by no means perfect, but I think the difference between the online survey and the telephone survey is getting smaller and smaller every day. And the telephone survey, as we know from the buckles we've read about political campaigns nationally, they're also not perfect. And for our purposes in a trial setting, their imperfections are not as important, which is to say, if I'm doing a political campaign, it's important for me to know who's winning and who's losing. But it's more important for me to know, how do I get to be winning, right? So again, it's the statistical analysis of the underlying data that's the most important element of doing the survey. But your client always wants to know who's winning, right? If we're doing it for trial purposes, and the number we're most concerned about, because we've got liability information from the focus groups, the number we're most concerned about has to do with what the damages assessment is. And again, it's nice to know, are we winning or losing this case? But really what I'm concerned about is what are the underlying attitudes that these respondents have that create a, a statistically reliable predictor of where they'll come down in the case. And that's where you can use it both to have some certainty about the value of the case, as well as come jury selection, to be able to go in and do some statistical modeling. It's all econometrics. It's all that it's the same thing we use for economic forecasting to do analysis of the underlying data to understand which attitudes make someone a plaintiff's juror versus a defense juror. And if I can get that down to two or three questions you can ask in voir dire that are going to be able to identify 80 or 85% of the defense jurors, that's a wonderful tool. And it doesn't always happen that I've got that precise a tool, but it really doesn't happen where I don't get some advantage in jury selection out of that survey. 
So primarily if we're, you know, most cases settle, as we all know. But when they don't, that survey becomes a very important tool in guiding jury selection. Have you given our listeners enough information on the survey side and its utility for us to take the next step as we get ready for trial in terms of jury selection and at the risk of detouring? I want to make sure that people understand kind of the full panoply of what a strategic case consultant or jury consultant covers. Do you also do witness preparation work, media training work? Are there other things where your skill sets are complementary to make sure that a case stays on track if one, say, has a problematic client? Sure. The short answer is yes. The answer to your prior question is to know whether or not we've given your listeners enough information. I would say we never know unless we ask them. So should we be (laughs) stopping now? popping something up on a screen and doing a survey. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Where we should call each and every one of your listeners and get their feedback in a qualitative way. But since we don't have the luxury of that opportunity. So yeah, witness prep is all part of it. I would not for a moment argue that I'm the best, actually one of the very best people in witness prep is right here in the Bay Area. But we do it. And I always find it fun. It's only fun because it's a challenge. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, what I bring to that is having done media training for political candidates for years and years and years and years, and years understanding how to stay on message. It's a, it's a different issue with most witnesses we're doing prep for, getting them to understand to limit the range of their response or the scope of their response to make sure that they're not providing too much information or more information than they should or need to provide. It's a slightly different animal. But working with individuals and helping guide them to seeing the way to managing what I always refer to as the encounter, whether it's a political candidate being interviewed by the press or giving a speech to a huge forum or going and doing a debate or whether it's a witness preparing for a deposition, I refer to all those as encounters and helping them to find ways to more easily have a comfort level and tools for managing the encounter, I think is fun. That all makes a lot of sense. We've covered focus groups, surveys. I expect the survey informs a jury questionnaire to the extent that a judge is going to allow one. And it also informs jury selection questions to the extent that an attorney gets the opportunity to do jury selection. Correct. Can you expand on how that survey data helps you and what you do with an attorney to help make sure that the team has the right information to take every advantage possible to help their client? Well, the analysis of the survey data that helps you create predictors for whether someone's going to be a plaintiff or a defense juror is helpful for both oral voir dire and for a supplemental juror questionnaire. I don't separate those in my mind. I mean, anything that you can ask in a supplemental juror questionnaire, you can ask during oral voir dire. Not everything you can do in World War Dare, but a lot can be put into a supplemental juror questionnaire. But to me, it's all part of one process. You know, it's the information gathering about the juries, jury pools, you know, about what individual members of the dire have to say or think about various topics. So if I've got a set of things which I think are good predictors based on the data analysis of where they're going to come down, then I want to make sure that I can incorporate those into the jury selection process, whatever that looks like. So in a state that's got good voir dire, like California, we have the opportunity to include those questions in a supplemental juror questionnaire, if there is one, in your oral voir dire, helping my clients to understand, if I'm not going to be there, helping them understand what are the real key questions that you should be looking for answers to that will help you identify uh, the people you need to strike, prioritize the people you need to strike. Uh, If I am going to be there, obviously, then... You know, I can take notes, consult with my client during the process, and we can communicate about each of these potential jurors as we move along through the process. But the idea is to make sure that my client knows what is the most important information they need to tease out of the panel and what to do with it. What are the cues to tell you this is someone you need to do more follow-up with, or this is someone we can't afford to have on this jury, or this is someone that you know, at some point you just want to shut up and leave them alone, right? You don't want to identify your best jurors for the other side. So I will spend some time briefing my client on that. If I'm not going to be there, if I am going to be there, we're usually the night before jury selection begins, we sit down and we go through a couple of notes outline. I will usually work through with my client a voir dire outline 
whether it's one that my client has prepared and sends to me for review or whether it's one that I've prepared and given to them. I generally like the former primarily because everyone's got their own style. And in the same way, going back to my political background, you know, writing speeches, which I loved doing when I was doing politics, I loved writing speeches, but you have to figure out how to write in the voice of your candidate, right? Well, voir dire's got a lot of the same elements to it. And when my client prepares a voir dire outline and sends it to me to comment, to add to, to strike, I get from that some of my client's voice. And I also get from that the order in which they tend to be most comfortable raising these topics, which is not to say I don't make suggestions on changing the order, but I can understand the way they want to approach it. And I think one of the most important things during the voir dire process is you've got to be comfortable with what you're doing, right? I mean, if you're not comfortable with it, the jurors are not going to be comfortable with you. And if the jurors are not comfortable with you before the first witness even goes on the stand, you got a big problem. Uh, so working through what that voir dire outline looks like, uh, what to make sure we know what the topics are we have to cover, what to do with the information, what it comes to, that's all informed through the data analysis of a survey, as well as through the focus groups. I mean, you, there are things that become obvious in the focus groups, as well as through plain common sense. Anybody who goes on a work site without putting a helmet on is a jerk and they, you know, they get what they deserve, right? I mean, you don't need to do a survey to know that's not a jury you want to have. Oh, gosh. I, <laughs> I, did I misread that? I thought <laughs> yeah. that one was, was for us. Yeah. No, no, she was for the other side, actually. And we've talked about this, Miles. We've talked about it many times, but you know, none of these are guarantees. None of these are golden tickets, but they're all tools. And the more tools you have in the toolbox that you know how to take advantage of them and use them properly, the more successful you're going to be in building your case. I want to focus in on something that you said in terms of an attorney being comfortable doing jury selection, because I've run into a lot of different trial attorneys and a common thread with people is that they love opening, they love cross-examination, they love closing, they sort of like direct exams that might be a little bit more of a challenge, but the thing that terrifies them the most or worries them the most is doing jury selection. Have you worked with attorneys like that? And do you have recommendations for attorneys like that in terms of how to overcome any concerns? Certainly, that is the most frightening aspect for many, many lawyers. And I do work with lawyers precisely because of this. And I think I've told you in the past in our private conversations, one of my favorite things that I do is working with baby lawyers. And usually when I'm working with baby lawyers, this is the big thing. I've got a case coming up, I think it's next week, with an attorney who's been very well trained, he's been groomed, he's been brought along, and now he's going to do voir dire all by himself for the very first time. So I'm going out two days early and we're going to practice and we're going to rehearse. And this is actually an aspect where live focus groups are huge. We, I have done live focus groups for seasoned attorneys where all we're doing is voir dire. We get 24 people, we recruit them, we put them in a focus group room, classroom style or theater style, and we do two hours of voir dire. And it's very useful both in sort of conquering the apprehension, I'm not going to call it fear, Nervous, everyone gets, you know, actors get nervous before they go on stage to perform Shakespeare for the 343rd time, right? But just to have a comfort level with the nerves and get rid of the apprehension and understand that you can work through this and where and when to follow up. One of the most common mistakes I see is the failure to follow up when you feel like you're pushing someone who was going to be resistant to what you want to present in your case. People get uncomfortable, they get nervous about it, and they move on to the next juror. It's a terrible mistake to make, and it's a very, very common mistake. Could you expand on that? Maybe give an example. We all like affirmation. The thing you're looking for in voir dire is you're looking for people who hate your case. <laughs> That's what you're looking for. And nobody wants to hear from a juror, you know, yeah, it sounds to me like that's really, you know, this is one of those things that like, eh, I don't understand why you're here in the first place, right? Or why you should even be allowed to be here. Well, that's someone that's easy to know you don't want to have on your jury. But when you're getting people who are more marginal in terms of their attitude, but their beliefs seem to be resistant to what we're trying to do, rather than engage that juror in order to probe more, why do you say that? My favorite, right? What made you think that? Tell me why. Talk to me about that. They move on for two reasons. One reason is because they don't want to have the confrontation. 
and they think the confrontation can be harmful to them or they just don't want to do it because it's not in their nature. The other reason is they're afraid of having bad thoughts aired to the whole veneer. They're going to poison the well. They're going to poison the jurors. And you know what? If you don't have the conversation about the bad stuff before they're on the jury, they're going to have it when they're deliberating. So getting people to understand that's really the most valuable jury they've got there is the one who's pushing back because that's someone who can really lead the conversation among the troops for the other side. So you can identify six of them instead of one of them. So you can get all of that aired and you can understand with those thoughts out there how you need to incorporate that belief into presentation of your case to overcome it, right? There's also just in plain body English, you want to be open to all of these negative thoughts. And literally, when the attorney is standing in the well and hearing bad stuff from potential jurors and they cross their arms and say, you know, well, thank you, Mr. Cooper. What about you, Ms. Robinson? You're telling them that you're upset as opposed to, thank you, Mr. Cooper. I really appreciate that. To probe that and get them talking about it in a way where you're really encouraging it and you're really open to it it's a very important thing to do and understand how you present yourself has a lot to do with how much they're willing to open up to you. So it is well worth practicing that in a forum that is not just your colleagues and coworkers in the law firm, because they're going to have a hard time putting themselves in the position who thinks that your case is garbage and you're a jerk, right? But with a group of random people that can provide legitimate feedback and can walk through it that way, I think it's very, very valuable to do that kind of rehearsal. And when you're drawing that information out from the person who has negative things to say about a case, are you doing that because you're wanting to get all the information from that person because you're trying to, to establish a, a successful cause challenge for that person? What's the thinking behind keeping that person talking? Well, all of the above. I mean, obviously, you always want to work hard to build a cause challenge for someone who you don't want to have on the jury. Much better to have the cause challenge than have to use a strike, right? So pushing them to get to the cause challenge, and when I say pushing them, I'm not leaning off them, but I want there to be enough conversation and enough follow-up to get them to the point where they say one side or the other has an advantage or that they'd be inclined to think ill of one party or the other, however, whatever language that they're going to use. But also, I want Venire members to become spokespeople for other people who feel the same way so that you're trying to get them to model the behavior for their colleagues so more people will speak up about that. If someone comes along and says, uh, you know what, I think people who ride motorcycles are risk takers, and I don't mean to say that they deserve what they get, but they're risk takers, and therefore, they've got to assume some responsibility for what happened. Because if they weren't riding a motorcycle, it wouldn't happen, right? Well, I don't want to shut that person down. I want to find out everyone else who thinks the same way about people who ride motorcycles if I got a plaintiff who's a motorcycle rider, right? And I want to have them talk enough to be able to say the magic words that would say, yeah, I mean, all I'll say, well, sure. The guy who rides a motorcycle doesn't really start out the same way as someone who is driving in a car. And so you'd be inclined to say that the other side here has an advantage. Yeah, probably, Right. I want to get to that point and I want to welcome that because I don't want that person when they say, you know, the motorcycle rider is a risk taker and the attorney then says, thank you very much. What about you, Mr. Smith? They're typically saying in a way that discourages Mr. Smith from saying what he really thinks about motorcycle riders, right? And I need to know how Mr. Smith thinks. So I want to reward the person who speaks up. I want to ask in, in your role as you're preparing the team to go in, and I'm, I'm talking team because... Usually there's more than one attorney in a courtroom at this point, and you're also there. Do you give any recommendations or do you participate in eyeballing the jury in terms of looking for the head nods? When Mr. Smith is saying, yeah, motorcyclists, I don't want to say that they get what's coming to them, but they're risk takers. Are you working with people to make sure that either you or others are spotting the head nods so that you can make sure that even if somebody doesn't raise their hand, that, you know, ask that question number two, because I saw some movement there. Yeah. Depending on the physical layout of the courtroom, I mean, sometimes I'm able to hand a note. I've got one client who does all of his voir dire sitting at counsel tables, so it's really easy. I can lean over and whisper to him. I can pass him a note. Most of my clients prefer to be standing in the well. So uh, I keep a running list so that when we have a break, 
I can go back and say, you know, circle back to juror number 14 because I think they had an issue with whatever. How do you parse all of the landscape? Because you're listening to the answer, but you're also paying attention and that requires a lot of focus. How do you do that? Yeah, first, it's impossible to do it all. True answer is I'm sure there's plenty that I miss. Um, The other thing I will tell you is it's exhausting. I go home after every time I pick a jury, I go home and and I say to my wife, I am so tired. I don't see how these people do it like for a 14-day trial because it just requires every ounce of attention to follow all the cues you can. But even then, I'm not getting it all. There's often, if not always, uh, an associate sitting there too, where they're doing the same thing and they'll, you know, it, it, team is the right word. I mean, there's consultation, conversation back and forth, but absolutely, we're obviously missing things along the way. Having a system for keeping notes and keeping track of everything is a very important part of the process. And I've experimented with several over the years. I have one now that I think works as well as it's going to work. I will tell you this, I'm never watching my client. During voir dire, I'm never watching my client. I am always watching the jurors or I'm watching my pencil as I'm writing down notes, which also means I miss things from time to time, right? I mean, if my client's sending the wrong signal for whatever reason with his or her body language, I'm missing that. But at that point, my attention is really entirely on what's going on. And again, depending where you are in Illinois, it's really easy. You're only talking to the jurors who are in the box at that moment. In California, you got a veneer of 80 people. You're talking to all 80 of them at once. It's a much harder thing to do. Attorney voir dire is a new thing in Massachusetts um, just before the pandemic. That's how long it's been around, just that long. And most judges want to do it one-on-one. They think it's more efficient. They think it prevents the voir dire process from polluting the jury pool. I mean, I've heard from a lot of judges as to why they do it that way. Some of them do it that way because that's the only way they've seen it done or could imagine being done. But there, it's very, I mean, obviously, you only have to pay attention to one juror at a time. The other jurors can't hear what the questions are, but it's just so limiting because you can't get that conversation started. You can't engage in that dialogue. I think parties on both sides benefit tremendously from having the dialogue, right? It's not faster. It's not more efficient, but there's a whole bunch of judges in Massachusetts who just feel that's the way to do it. It's sort of a draining process. I want to follow up with a comment you made about note-taking strategies. I've used a number of different methods to approach that. And I know that there are also programs and apps out there that people use. What method are you using now and do you like it and why? Yeah, I use Ed's method. (laughs) One thing that I think I can do better than my clients is I can take notes better because they're busy asking questions and thinking about the next question. And that doesn't really allow you standing in the well, the ability to take great notes. So I have the luxury of not having to ask any questions. I can eyeball all of them, right, and see how they're reacting and take fairly good notes. But my method really is, a, I mean, I don't think it's that unique. I mean, I've always used Post-its. The question is how I'm arranging them and managing, right? And right now, literally what I do is I take a bunch of file folders and I rip them in half. So I've got now a bunch of fairly stiff back eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper on which I will slap three by three Post-it notes. That's six jurors, right? And the reason I do it this way, after doing a whole lot of drawing grids, you know, coming with a ruler, <laughs> using, uh, I've tried some of the apps. I don't like them because I think you spend too much time with the app and not enough time with the juror, if that makes any sense. It does. But doing it this way, I can arrange my layout pretty much to match any courtroom. I mean, every courtroom's got a different layout. With people seated in the gallery that are going to be questioned in California, that's the norm, Right. So I can arrange them any way that I need to. And then I'm just, you know, with Post-its, particularly in California, we've got strike and replace. You know, it's easy to move someone from one spot to another. So it's just a question for me, not so much the process on Post-its. It's the process of managing how do I come up with a chart that mirrors what I'm likely to see in the court. And it just gives me some flexibility to move things around that way. I want to talk a little bit about strikes and strategy. Without giving away... Lazarus secret sauce. Do you have a way of approaching the strike issue when it comes down to, we've done all the cause challenges and six and six. How do you approach that with your team and what are your recommendations? Yeah. So I always count backwards, right? I'm looking at how far out do we go, 
right? We've done the cost challenges. So now what's the farthest extreme of jurors that we can reach? And then simply, who do we least want to have on this jury? So, and again, every jurisdiction does this differently. You can backstrike, I think, in most places in California. Define backstrike, please. Let me define what it's not. That's the easier way to do it. So in some jurisdictions, if you have accepted a juror, and by accepted, I simply mean, okay, here's the 12 you've got. And, you know, we'd like to uh, thank and excuse juror number three. Then the defense either accepts that or doesn't accept that. It comes back to us. And we say, we like this panel. And the defense then strikes someone else. Backstrike would allow you to strike someone that you accepted before. And if you can't backstrike, if you said they were good, they're good, period, right? So again, depending on what the rules are in that courtroom of how it's going to work, you know, am I allowed to backstrike or not? That has an impact on, on the order in which I will use my strikes, right? Who I will strike first. For now, in some courtrooms, if I strike juror number eight, that means I've accepted one through seven. So if I can come back to juror number two later, that gives me more flexibility, right, in terms of recommending who it is that we want to strike. And, and I should say, you know, this is always done in consultation with, with my client. And all the time, we're going to disagree on somebody somewhere in the process. Sometimes we disagree on a lot of people in the process. But sometimes I encounter a situation where there's a juror I don't have good feelings about. My client likes them. And also sometimes there are people that, that I don't have a problem with. But my client will say, I feel uncomfortable with that juror. I was getting bad vibes from that juror when I was asking questions. So I am almost always going to defer and not make a big stink about that. There are occasions where I will. There's one that stands out in my mind very strongly where I stamped my feet and persuaded my client to listen to me about that one particular juror. But I will usually defer. And the reason I will usually defer is, again, because it's got to do with my client's comfort level when standing in front of that jury. I don't want my client to be uncomfortable about who they're presenting to, about how they're being judged while they're presenting. That just, I think, sets up a bad dynamic for the rest of the trial. But I will tell you, in one case, it was an asbestos trial, and there was a particular juror who was a school teacher, and we knew because in that state we were allowed to have juror research, background research on jurors, We had political affiliation, and we had, from her social media, we had some organizations that she was involved in, and she looked at that surface level like someone who was not going to be sympathetic to a plaintiff's case. She also said, during the course of voir dire, when asked about her favorite hobby, she said she was an organic gardener. I figure there's probably not a lot of organic gardeners who are going to like asbestos dust. And my client was pointing to the party registration, the fact that she would be a leader because she was a teacher, the social club she belonged to, this is not a plaintiff's juror. I kept saying, yeah, but you know what? She's an organic gardener. I just have a hard time believing an organic gardener is going to take the side of this business company. So he finally relented. She became the foreperson of the jury, and we got what was then a record-breaking verdict, which was overturned at the Supreme Court level. (laughs) But... um. So there are rare cases like that where I just have a very strong conviction about something where I will, I will stamp my feet a lot. That's helpful. You mentioned leader. As you were rating people to strike, is it a, a lodestar? Is it a gestalt? Is it a leader, bad leaders first? How do you come up with a calculus for making recommendations? Well, with regard to the leadership issue, I certainly don't want someone on that jury who looks like they're going to be a leader and we don't have an understanding of whether they're going to have a plaintiff's or defendant's predisposition, right? So if it's someone who's going to be a strong leader and we just have no idea, I mean, sometimes actually we do say it all comes down to what is Sally going to do? And sometimes for various reasons in the conversation with my client, we say, we got to try this case to Sally and that's what we're going to do. And again, that happens because you've got a limited number of strikes, right? But usually if there's someone there who is exhibiting traits of leadership, they're confident, they speak their mind, they've got an opinion on all the questions being asked during all voir dire, they've had a management position or they're teachers or whatever, but, you know, they, they look like, and, and people, by the way, you know, part of what you're looking at when you're watching the jurors is how they react to each other, right? I mean, we're looking, when they go out for their lunch break, who's walking next to who, 
I mean, you know, to the extent possible, and it's impossible to get all of this, but to the extent possible, that's useful information to have. But someone who looks like they could be a leader and we just don't have any kind of sense about them, I'd rather not take the risk if we don't have to. If you've got six strikes and there's eight people you don't want to have on your jury and two of them are kind of quiet, those are the two you leave on versus the ones who are loud and definitive and assertive and, you know, and sort of charismatic in the way they interact with others. As you go through this process, do you ever, from a game theory perspective, make a recommendation of, look, the defense is going to have to go. So let's pass first so that we're one up. All the time. (laughs) Um, That's part of what makes it fun for me. Uh, We do that all the time. I'm always trying to figure out who they're going to strike. And I'm never 100% correct. Sometimes I'm not 50% correct. Uh, Yeah, it, it, it puzzles me a lot. Why did they leave that person on that jury? I mean, I literally, I go home wondering, what you know, what am I missing? And it's somewhat validating when it comes back and we got a good verdict. To me, the most mystifying part of this process is why opposing counsel left particular jurors on or why they chose to strike particular juror. There's some jurors that I think we don't like. I don't think the other side likes them either. So in terms of the game theory aspect of it, I'm always going to try to leave those to the other side to strike them as long as I possibly can get away with doing that. It also depends, too, how civil and cooperative opposing counsel are, right? I mean, there's sometimes you just you can just walk up and say, neither of us want to have this juror on here, right? Can we just agree and stipulate that they're gone? And sometimes you'll have opposing counsel who, as obvious as it is, they will dig in their heels <laughs> and, refuse, and then they'll wind up striking them later. I mean, there's sometimes, literally, I try to, to the extent that I can in the small amount of time that I'm there, I try, if possible, to create a rapport with not just my clients, but people across the aisle, right? So sometimes you just sort of look over either at the opposing counsel or they've got a jury consultant. You can just sort of look over and kind of, and you know that we're all going to be fine and we're going to agree that we're going to get rid of that juror and no one has to ask them questions anymore. But the game theory aspect of trying to force them to use their strikes on people that we think ought to go to leave someone who, for whatever reason, you know, we want to skip this one to see what they do, that happens every time. Part of the fun. (laughs) For someone who is less skilled in that department, in the game theory or whatever you want to call it, what have you done over the course of your career that has helped you be good at that game? And what few things could somebody do to help improve that? First, let's make clear that this is a combination of science, art, and psychology. Psychology is a science, but it's a social science. (laughs) I'm I'm trained academically as a social scientist, so... You know, I get both sides. I get the social and the science part. So it's not perfect science. It's not a hard science. There's a lot of judgment that comes in. But I think, well, one thing is I enjoy it. You know, some of my partners in my trial consulting firm at Winning Works just don't like it. And they're all lawyers, but they just don't like it. But in my university, in my PhD program, you had to find three specialty fields, getting a PhD in political science, which I never finished my dissertation. So one of my fields was essentially, it was called contemporary analytic democratic theory, which were theories of social justice, but it included a lot of game theory. And so that was good background in terms of literature. And then also one of my fields was political behavior. One of my dissertation advisors' wife used to say, political behavior is like people running around behaving politically. (laughs) (laughs) But really what it was, was um, social psychology in a political context. So I think academically that gave me some background. It's the kind of stuff I kind of enjoy thinking about anyway. And since that time, which is now, gosh, 40 years ago, I wouldn't say I've kept up with all of the academic literature by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm still picking up books in the field that are relevant. That's all helped. Between the nerves of talking to strangers, the need to be absorbing all sorts of information while asking questions, and then figuring out the strategic strike piece, I'm guessing that's why people call on you as opposed to trying to do it alone. Yeah, I think so. I think I bring value to my clients. And if I didn't, I wouldn't have the nerve to charge the money for what I do. And I still enjoy it. So that's why I still do it. I mean, I'm reaching the age where I'm trying to do less, as you well know. But I'd like to think that's why. But I also think there's an aspect to why people hire jury consultants that has nothing to do with that. I think it's got to do with some sense that they think they should. And that goes all the way back to my days as a political consultant. 
that there were clients I had, you know, they knew they had to hire a media consultant to produce the ads because they couldn't do that themselves. But there were a lot of them who never understood why they needed a pollster. If I don't know my constituency well enough to know what they're thinking, I shouldn't be running for office. I'm thinking of a particular politician in Connecticut who ran successfully one time for Congress and lost his first re-election campaign in the same cycle where I was pitching him to hire me to do his polling. And he said, ah, we don't need to have polling. But a lot of people, at least back then in the 80s and early 90s, hired pollsters because there was an expectation that you needed to have a name pollster in order to be successful. And therefore, you couldn't raise any money if you didn't have a name pollster and a name media consultant. I think there's an extent to which some people hire a jury consultant, or we like to call ourselves litigation coaches, because they think they should. I've got a big case, it's an important case, and therefore I should hire a jury consultant and don't really know what they're looking for, how to use them, or how to get the most out of them. I think in the way that that you have engaged me, which is to say you're not just engaging me in an eight-figure case, you're engaging me in cases that are legitimate, real, serious, and important cases, certainly to your clients, but not in cases that necessarily would make one think, oh, well, who is your jury consultant, Right. So yes, in your case, I'd like to think that you're hiring me because I bring something to the table as opposed to because you think you should. And that's also, again, always gratifying. So thank you. Well, thank you because we do get value out of the relationship and out of what we develop in our cases. I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Bats and Wheeler and how you handle that when you're in the courtroom helping jurors. And for those who that doesn't ring a bell with, if one side or the other is striking people in a pattern that is racist, sexist, national origin, et cetera, one can raise a Batson Wheeler challenge that, that, that violates the rules. Has that come up for you? And if so, how have you handled it? Yeah. First, I'm going to tell you a story. (laughs) It's my favorite Batson story was an asbestos case, same lawyer, different case in Illinois with a terrific judge, the judge I think the world of. And we struck a juror who was a white male and opposing counsel raised a Batson objection to that, saying there was nothing in that juror's responses which justified striking the white male that was on the panel. And I was looking through, I keep very careful notes about the strikes. And uh, I'm looking through their strikes. Wait a second. There are six challenges. They used four from white males. <laughs> and so I'm leaning over to my client to inform him of that when the judge says, well, didn't you strike a number of white males? <laughs> that pretty much ended the conversation. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, so bats and challenges come up from time to time. I'm not making recommendations with that in mind at all. So when they have come up and it happens, you know, occasionally, but I've got notes documenting why we didn't like that juror. You can present those to the judge in sidebar. And again, it's not an issue I'm thinking about. I'm thinking more substantively about what these jurors said or didn't say. I mean, I'm always frightened by jurors that don't say anything. They worry me a lot. Here's the thing. I don't think there is a demographic silver bullet. I never have. And I think I've probably said this to you. So when people are going to say, well, we want, you know, we want jurors who are this or jurors who are that, I said, no, I want jurors who don't think these things. And that's what the voir dire process is to find out. If I've identified through the focus groups and the survey analysis that here are the attitudes that will kill us, I'm looking to find out, do they have those attitudes? And I don't think demographic silver bullets are correct substantively. You know, that's where you'd get into trouble in a Batson challenge, I would think, if you think, oh, well, we can't have, you know, white men over 45, they'll kill us. The person who's going to kill us are the people who come in with a particular set of beliefs that we can either identify through common sense or through the data we've gone through. And that's what I'm looking for. I have not encountered a situation where opposing counsel has successfully used a Batson challenge against us. The flip side of that, as part of what you're doing, are you looking out for the other side engaging in Batson Wheeler behavior? Yeah, occasionally. I mean, if I'm playing the game in my mind of who I would strike if I were on their side, And if I get three or four of them right, never get all six of them right. (laughs) But if I get three or four of them right, and I'm seeing there's a substantive reason why they struck those people, then I'm going to stop worrying about it. If they start striking people for reasons which make absolutely no sense to me, they always will strike somebody that I just didn't figure out. But if they're doing a consistent job of striking people that just make no sense to me substantively, then I start paying more attention. 
but I've never pushed to the point, I don't think, of advising my client to raise a Batson challenge. So we've talked about focus groups, surveys, preparing witnesses, jury questionnaires, jury selection. Is there other information that you think our listeners should know that we haven't covered as far as the role that you play in helping clients win their cases? What I like to think that I'm doing is helping to build a trial story and using research tools to build that trial story and then jury selection to implement it and and help with openings. I help with closing arguments to the extent that I can. I mean, sometimes I will get a good enough summary of what's been happening every day or every other day that I can help structure what the closing argument looks like. But I'm also certainly helping with openings to implement that trial story. And in doing that, it's not just about having the conversations and focus group and having the data analysis, but in terms of thinking about the decision-making behavior, and that's really what we're getting to here is how do these jurors make their decisions? Bringing in the jury bias model, what are the biases that jurors are likely to bring into a courtroom, not just into a courtroom, but into their assessment of watching the news or, you know, or how they evaluate political candidates, the same biases pretty much kick in. And also the thing that's relatively newer for me is uh, I also try to incorporate moral foundation theory in what I'm doing, which is a fairly new academic discipline. You're going to need to find that. Moral foundation theory says, look, there are different cultures and different societies have different moral codes, right? And what moral foundation theory does is it, it starts by saying, what are the basic elements that go into a moral code in different balance? There is a uh, sanctity, attitudes toward, you know, Mother Earth is a liberal approach to sanctifying the environmental movement. How these elements play against each other or, or interact with each other in creating a moral code helps you define or helps you understand competing moral systems. By competing, I mean they're fighting against each other, but different, you know, different moral systems. And making sure that we're including in our trial story something that appeals to each of these pillars. So that if I'm someone who puts a great deal of value in authority, how can we present a case so that those people find our case is respectful of authority, right? If I'm someone who has a great deal of concern for others, a lot of empathy, how do we present our case that strikes a chord for those people? For team and for other, for team build, loyalty is one of the pillars, right? And loyalty is different, by the way, by gender. So when we talk about loyalty among men, we're talking about loyalty to the team or the country or the nation. When we're talking about loyalty among women, it's loyalty to the other individual, to my partner, to my child, which is very interesting. But how do we build a trial story that strikes an element in each of these foundations to a moral code? So whether someone's, and this comes from, frankly, the problem is as we have a more and more polarized society here, how do you present a case that appeals to liberals and conservatives? I mean, that's why I started looking at this stuff. And if you are hitting on all five of these pillars, then you're putting together a trial story that appeals across the partisan divide. I started doing this again slightly before the pandemic. I lectured on it in the CLA circuit, you know, several times. So putting together elements of building the trial story is really the target that I'm shooting for anyway. And all of the other things, the focus groups, the surveys, how you use jury selection, they're all building toward how do we get that trial story put together and how do we get it communicated most effectively, which comes, you know, that's the witness prep, that's helping with openings, that's helping with uh, closing arguments when I can. Um, so that's sort of the global piece of it. So in terms of how I view my role in the end, I think my job is to make your job easier. And if I'm successful, then you have an easier job putting on your case, you're more successful in the end. And that's what I think the role of the jury consultant is in the big picture. And I would say the most important thing is when it's all said and done and it's all over, never a bad idea to have a hot fudge Sunday. <laughs> and given that you're visiting San Francisco, and thank you for doing that for this and for other reasons, is there a hot fudge Sunday that would be your go-to in the general area? Oh, sure. Because I, I, I mean, my mom lives on Russian Hill. So you walk down the hill to your deadly chocolate factory and you get one down there. But the Swenson's hot fudge Sunday is pretty good too. So 
same ice cream. <laughs> well, Ed, I really appreciated our conversation and thank you for coming on and look forward to talking again. Well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. And thank you for listening today. Please email us at podcast at coopers.law with questions, comments, feedback, and suggestions that you have related to jury consulting and work that you've done in terms of trial prep. Like what you heard? Share us with a colleague and leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. To all of you doing justice out there, happy hunting. Happy hunting.